All right, I'm at R Squared in Staples, Texas, and they're printing a demonstration house on their Black Flow concrete printer. Uh, we're gonna watch the print live today and see how it goes. Right now they're uh, preparing some horizontal reinforcement that's going in every 10 or 12 layers. Uh, it's a pretty relaxed job site. Two people at the mixer pump system, one person uh, operating and monitoring the material, and uh, right now two people preparing the horizontal reinforcement. How's the audio? I'm using a uh, lavalier mic. If you can't hear me very well, say something in the comments. In the back, you can see they're misting the concrete and then they're hand misting as well to uh, make sure it cures properly. You don't want to get any cracking, so keeping it hydrated uh, throughout the curing process can reduce cracking events. Jason, what time did you guys start printing today? Today we got started uh, about 6.30. Uh, had a really nice dry run going uh, and a good slurry right before and uh, gave us confidence to pop off and get this thing going. We got a heck of a team going today. It's really great. It seems like there's a little material change uh, from the, it's maybe a little drier than on the top section. Yeah, so this is uh, one of the things that we tested on the first house uh -huh. is printing in the harsh Texas sun, yeah, uh, which is really important because uh, we're not going to be fortunate enough, or maybe we will someday, uh, to be fortunate enough to print in beautiful 88 degree days. And uh, I think we're sitting at like 65% humidity, so we're right in the sweet spot. Uh, but we need to test it against all elements. So uh, what we're seeing here is the division of those or that material is the heat coming in. Uh, the, you can see it's probably about 12 layers down, something like that. 
uh, when the sun really started to hit it before we hit the misters on it. Um, I was here just a week ago, and since then, I posted the video from that visit today but now we're live. So there's two big updates. I noticed the hose management system you told me about on the misting. Uh, how have those impacted your, your print process? Well, uh, you know, the more you get your hands on it, the more you can uh, mess around and see what works for your team specifically uh, and what works for the machine best. Uh, ultimately, we're trying to automate this stuff. So uh, whatever we can put in there that helps us do that, uh, we're gonna give a shot. Awesome, man, thank you. Yes, sir. I, uh, I was really scared about the hose, and I was like, okay, I'm going to talk, but I'm going to have to run in two seconds. Uh, it is, like, so close. It's almost perfect. It looks pretty good so far. What's the issue? So, uh, what ends up happening is if you don't get the collars um, to be tight on the hose. Hey, Shelby, for you. It sags too low and hits. It does sag too low, yeah. And what we did on the backside with the spring is so that it gives it the tension to flop over and roll so it's not laying down. Uh, that that one was the first one we've had in three prints, mm -hmm. something like that. So we'll work on it. Yeah, solid. What's going on? Good to see you, buddy. I got the video out today. Oh, yeah, Chris sent it to me. I kind of look at it. You're famous now. Oh, yeah? Good. I've been waiting on it. Hey Shelby, is that filled with just water? What's that? Yes, sir. Plain water. Yes, sir. This is Shelby. It's working with the R squared team. Uh, how's it going, man? Oh, it's going, buddy. It's going for sure. What are you keeping an eye on today? Uh, we're keeping an eye on the moisture content in our printed layers. Um, some of them are drying out quicker in the sun than the shaded areas, so we're making sure we get a consistent uh, level of moisture throughout, throughout the print until, uh, until we come to a stopping point. Awesome, man. Thanks. As the temperature is changing throughout the day, they have to adjust the parameters uh, as needed. And so in Texas this morning, it was like 60 degrees and it'll probably get up to high 80s or 90. Uh, so being cognizant of that and making appropriate adjustments throughout the print is critical to maintaining a consistent layer quality. Thank you. 
Tell you, man, that bit, the little short you did with the uh, showing the support column, kind of showcase. I love seeing little things that validate what we do, and, and, and that our thinking is in line with others that are in this industry. Also, see this, right? So it gives me hope that people, more people that build, are actually getting their hands on this, instead of it just being in the hands of the manufacturer, or the printer manufacturers. Talked about that a little last time, I think. Yeah, I like the idea of decentralized. Yeah. Well, ultimately, you want a trailer. I mean, I think we're at the point where you hand the tool over to the men who know how to build uh, and get them excited about building with something new that's going to, you know, it's going to take a little time to learn, get good at, but that that short term. Pain is going to be long-term gain when you can run a crew. Well, with some of the shipping challenges you were discussing earlier, the uh, printer wasn't really fully operational for you until fairly recently, right? Yeah, we were. We had the printer on site here June 29th. We didn't, we didn't buster out of the box until the second. So it's been. A little under two months and at this point you guys are running pretty smooth relaxed with uh less guys on the crew than you had last time i was here and uh it seems like that learning curve uh you got past it pretty quick it's it's all a testament to the team uh i said this last time i think it's really important to uh have a good balance on your team uh, we have guys that are thinkers and doers, right? Uh, guys who chose a profession that gets you out in the sun and working hard on your body, but uh, also the pride in that work and knowing that I did that when you drive by. It's pretty awesome. Uh, but yeah, having those guys who are also smart, uh, but don't have a problem spraying a hose. And what would you say to other contractors, people that want to get involved with the technology, uh, that want to operate these systems, uh, is it something that uh, they, is reasonable to tackle? Yeah, I think so. Uh, it's I'm always reminded of this thing when I did uh, driving school. It was uh, their thing was burro uh, sabe mas que tu, and it's basically we can teach a burro, we can teach you, right? So uh, I feel like that's kind of where we are right now is the hardest part is that control unit, right? The rest of this stuff, we've seen big machines move. We know uh, the general, you know, it's moving on X, Y, Z. Uh, most of these guys go off of a plan anyway. So we set the wall widths anyway, so we can go deeper into that. But uh I think we got an awesome well, team. You guys are definitely trailblazers, uh, especially for this region of Texas. Uh, how do you think in the future the network utility will come out more and there'll be more like community benefits uh, for the industry, like leaning well, on people with experience? We already, well, you started that uh, for us uh, quite a bit, introducing us to other uh, highly intelligent people who are who have been uh, digging into this, you know, uh, 3D printing uh, concrete uh, or 3D printing itself is not new. Uh, it's just the material that we're using is a little bit different and, and, and unconventional. But, uh, you know, meeting Stefan Manser and uh, talking with Babic uh, over at Emergent, uh, dealing with Todd, dealing with Christian, uh, George Perry is a genius on concrete, so it's perfect to have him around. So anyways, we 
it's we've kind of now. cultivated very that right small number of people that have any kind of experience but as it gets bigger and more contractors maybe there's a two dozen in texas right uh what kind of benefits would there be from that oh i think it's great i mean we can we can definitely save on supplies uh if they're using a mix similar to ours uh we can source that relatively locally about four hour drive away uh instead of pulling it from the northeast uh, working on materials, I think the more collaboration we can do here, uh, you go quick alone, you go farther together, uh, and that's what we're looking for. Uh, like I said before, competition's not even a thing right now, and maybe when that becomes a deal, I'll be an old man, uh, or sitting on the beach, maybe, I don't know. Or maybe it's only a couple years from now. Or maybe it's only a couple years from now, and that's, that's going to be super exciting driving down the street and instead of seeing stick builds uh a whole bunch of framing and yellow wood you're going to see these houses right here with some gorgeous curves and tying a little bit more with how nature does it yeah i'm eager for the day i accidentally drive one by one i didn't know about same same awesome so yeah everything's going well today how many more hours of printing we About another Solid. Get to the windows. And then uh, we'll stop, probably let it sit for a little bit, eat, come back, uh, and then lay the crossbars for the window box mm -hmm. and begin printing away. Well, it's really so that it has a length to cross over. Uh -huh. Much more relaxed. I like hearing that. Uh, I feel like while the waters above appear calm, there's a frenzy of activity below. <laughs> I see. You know. This is, the same, but. this is a black buffalo machine operated by uh, R Squared in Staples, Texas. They got a good hose management system. They kind of jerry-rigged and uh, it got a person off the job of holding a hose, which is on many of the other 3D printed construction sites you've seen. So they uh, have a mister set up to automate part of the moisturing job that Shelby's doing over there. Black Buffalo by R squared in Texas. That's correct. Are you able to hear me? Hopefully the audio is okay. I'm using a lavalier. I can switch just to the phone mic if that's better. Okay, that's good. Thanks for the confirmation. You guys have any other questions? I like to think the office is dead. Everything's about uh, real work these days. Yeah, I agree. U.S. manufacturing and uh, decentralized manufacturing, not being reliant on uh, huge corporations always to build your things. It's not gonna be great. That's that. <clears throat> that could really very well save us, man. That uh, just in, in my humble opinion, the further you get out from 
uh, a solid community if you're not growing it well as you're growing, you lose it. Uh, and then you splinter off in faction, you know, and, and lose the the mission, the message, and all that stuff uh, as you're going forward. But if you can keep, you know, that goes back to how are we going to tie in with other guys in Texas? Build a community. <clears throat> get them involved. Get them excited. Lift each other up. We can all make nice live streams. I tell these guys, it's about the slow burn. We're not trying to burn this candle out. Yeah, a lot of your competitors probably are less uh, yeah. open to some of those mentalities, which makes it challenging. But you find the right couple and the, uh, the network utility there would be tremendous. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, look at just about every problem in the world. And what does it come back to? Greed. Trying to get more than what you... We're trying, trying to maximize, right? Especially with capitalism, and not to go too far down that rabbit hole. But, you know, it's all about maximizing profits. And we can find a good middle ground. Yeah, I like to think that uh, maximizing profits in the long term is done by Papa. doing good things and helping people. Agreed, agreed. Uh, I've always had that uh, really strong Papa. word of mouth uh, referral business. Because people appreciate, especially nowadays, that people show up, they do their job, they do it well, and it's for a reasonable price. And then they're willing also to come out and stand up to their equipment and say, I made a mistake, or this needs to be done, and I will be out there to make sure that it is right. Now that you've gotten to this point, I mean, a lot of people ask the uh, tough question of how much does it cost to build just a shell? And that's going to be different from a construction perspective in all 50 states right uh but for this project here now if a neighbor were to ask for a quote on something similar uh full height of say eight feet nine feet uh what would you quote that at for this structure right here which is about 510 square feet uh if i had to rough guess on the bags that we've used for this This 500 square foot is 3,500 bucks. In your cost, but you'd have to. Obviously... This is material concrete. Let's just make it an even four. And then the rotor. And then stator. the the uh, what's that? Some expendables like the rotor stator. Oh uh, uh, yeah, yeah. If we're talking about the entirety, like we're we're starting with the the machine out. A lot. And then you'd have to charge some sizable markup, certainly. Right. Well, the machine, it is a factor, but it also depreciates and, you know, all of all of that stuff. So that cost will go down uh, and, and end up leveling out. But uh, if you give straight, a guesstimate on a number, you'd say yes to if a neighbor said print this for is it ten thousand dollars, twenty thousand dollars. I mean, if we're doing just the walls, absolutely. Twenty, twenty five. Uh, it depends on the size of the house, of yeah. course. This is 500 uh, square feet. 500 square feet. Um, 25 would so get we, all your guys out there. You got right. the printer, you get the material there. Probably about 20, 25, 30 feet of uh, interior wall. It really depends on the width, width of the wall uh, of the interior, how many interior walls you're printing also, uh, if you're going to be using typical frame uh in some of those but that's also just yeah. the shell there's a lot of construction activities that need to happen for beyond sure that. and i think that's a huge part of your role is exploring the best way to implement those on the job site absolutely uh, you got some people here today checking out the print are they going to be involved in some of those activities yeah actually uh the great thing is these guys i guess are here uh to do uh look at the wire management and how we can keep that out of the machine's way, out of our way, and make it easier for us to disconnect and reconnect when we 
take the pieces of the machine apart and move it from side to side or uh, pad to pad, uh, which is pretty essential. I mean, other than the hose, the wiring obviously is uh, machine-wise probably the other the other biggest piece outside of the material handling elements. That's not a service you ever hear about on like a MacBook Pro or something. You gotta get it rewired. Or hey, right? I mean, you, if you've gotta get it rewired, you're going to the Genius Bar or you're buying a new printer, I mean, a new uh, computer. Innovation's not easy, but somebody's gotta do it, right? It's for sure. I mean, the smaller these things get, uh, the harder it is. I used to, as a kid, I mean, we would go to the dump uh, or drive and pick up off the curb something that would be a good piece for us to work on another, you know, we need the wiring, we need the capacitor, we need a motor, we need something off of something else that'll work right now. Sure. You know, so it's kind of what we're doing here. So far it's working. On a, on a much larger scale. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we're good. So this building is a, a test unit. Um, the mix they're using is proprietary to Black Buffalo. They got a AC509 approval on the mix. They're pretty far out from a fully automated process with no one on site, but people are being removed from the job site all the time. I mean, you see the, the mixer pump system over there. Some people are trying to move to batch plant mixers, which would eliminate the need for somebody at that part. And the hose management was something that somebody was having to carry last time I was here, and uh, now they've adjusted it so it doesn't need any human interaction. Most job sites have someone holding the, the hose uh, so that it doesn't swing into anything. It's quite heavy, filled with concrete. Um, but I don't like to speculate, so I wouldn't put any kind of time estimate on when they would be able to do a lights out operation. Colorado, I think somebody should be out there printing uh, within the next couple of years. There are some East Coast uh, players. Actually, this team is going to Virginia uh, pretty soon, I believe, to work on a house down over there, East Coast.
Saved his life this trial uh, because what happens is his blood will either clot or not. Right? It's it's a matter of the trigger that says, "Okay, you're not going to clot right now. You're going to bleed out." Papa, he had a he picked his nose one time and it was a little bloody. Well, it didn't stop. They had to go to the hospital and have the clot out. That's crazy. But they put him through this thing at Memorial Hermann through this blood study. And uh, it's, there's so many few people to do it uh, that he got three of his heart pots, which was pretty great. So he got both of his knees in place because he was about to be, well, he was in a, in a scooter because he couldn't walk anymore. The messed up thing about the, the whole deal is that it takes 
your uh, it, 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 it inhibits some of your healing. Makes so sense. You get bruises. You get uh, tissue deterioration. Something about hemoglobin. Yeah, it's uh, how it how it clogs and or doesn't, and thankfully he's not having kind of stroke. But he's But he survived it. That's pretty interesting. I always used to watch the show House. I don't know if you ever heard of that. I absolutely, if I had loved, fell in love with school, I would have been something like that. But school didn't do it for me. For me, I realized that. Use the GI Bill to get me basically anything that I need to learn. I've been able to take classes for I've been paid for a really nice benefit. Yeah, I had a college buddy, he's in Dallas now, who uh the GI Bill is like a great tool for people who are ready to take advantage of it. Yeah, exactly. It'd be great if some of that money I mean, it belongs to whoever, right? But if you're not going to use it, let's put some kids through school that they do want to use it, but just don't have the means. I mean, from service or yeah. or whatever, yeah. you know. With... That's how they do it, right? Dependents can, it can pass on to the dependent. Yeah, I'm excited. My uh, kiddos will get to use. So Texas has the Hazelwood Act which gives you a certain number of college credit hours if you've signed up for military service in the state of Texas or at the state of Texas state residence. Nice. And then the GI Bill, which is finite. It, uh, or at least post-9-11, the GI Bill is finite. How much longer till Texas has a separate military? Probably could. I was here two weeks after in Austin. Oh yeah. Yeah, my buddy I was staying with had like w- missing water PTSD, and so he had like a trash can just filled with water for weeks what until. <laughs> I was like, listen, let's go to the store. We'll buy eight cases of water. We could throw out this. We don't need to keep this, like, trash can of water. We had oiled uh, pots, the biggest ones we could find, uh, all of our camping stuff on the stove. For when we had gas. Hey, Shelby, one more time for me, Or we can go on that side. Hey Christian, how do you think the print's going right now? I think it's going pretty well, all things considered. We're finding some unfavorable conditions for printing concrete, mainly the really low humidity and the really high heat and the direct sunlight. But all things considered, I think we're doing a good job of uh, compensating, adjusting for the uh, the weather conditions, and it's going pretty well. We haven't had many stops, and it's looking good so far. How long have you been with Black Buffalo? Started in May, so wow. what is that, six months now? So most of your printing was in uh, New Jersey, Pennsylvania? Yeah, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is the main state that we print at um, for, for R&D purposes. That's where I've done most of my stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the guys say you're like pretty talented, and I've seen you jumping from the watching the material to the operator booth, uh, which in the past is a job done by two people. So, uh, <laughs> 
Well, there's, I got the advantage of being the young one on the team, right? So I still have the knees to jump around. <laughs> but it's it's just practice, right? The more you do anything, the more you get with it. So it's it's easier for me to jump around and do these different things than just for uh, you know, these guys. That's why I work with them. We're trying to get them up to uh, work with them to get there. Get there. Uh, they're really good as is. Yeah, with repetitions, you get the muscle memory. Uh, and so what are the things that you're kind of subtly keeping an eye on? I guess the level of the concrete there at the extruder head. Yeah, good, good job. Pump up! Uh, we're looking at, uh, yeah, I keep an eye on the material on the hopper. Give me a moment. Things get real during the print. We were talking about the different things you keep an eye on, like the the hopper level, the the way the material's coming out, if it's homogenous or not. Uh, yeah. So keep an eye on the current head hopper level. Uh, we'll keep an eye on how the bead is looking, if it's stretching, if it's compressing, if it's uh, sloshing over the edge. Um, and we try to compensate with what we can by adjusting the uh, print speed or the extrusion, the the extrusion rate. Um, just to do the best we can. Because the issue is we're not in a controlled climate, right? So you can't just set it and forget it. You gotta keep, keep on your toes and keep it adjusted. What's the maximum height you're confident printing in one go? As long as you keep the store wall up, you can go, I don't really have a, I don't really have a limit, you know? You haven't reached a collapse yet from the... Uh... No, especially with the, especially while installing the stir wall, um, that really does a lot to help keep the uh, keep the layers together. But they they dry pretty quick and they become pretty firm pretty quickly too, especially in this heat. So um, I'm not really concerned about how high we can go. It's more just wanted to get too hot for the material to work or wanted to get too hot for us to work. Yeah, that's true. So what's the layer time like right now? Layer time. I haven't kept an eye on it. I think Six, seven minutes. at, at 10,000 10, millimeters a minute, this is about a seven minute layer time. Seven minutes, 20 second layer time. We're running a bit above travel, running about 13,000 millimeters a minute. So I think probably around six and a half, six minutes, something like that. Yeah. So before March or May, what were you doing? I was a mechanical production engineer at an architectural lighting company. Mm -hmm. So a bit of a bit of a departure from that, but um, Mechanical, still mechanical. Exactly. That's it's about the mindset, I think. I've always thought engineering more about the mindset, which what you specialize in is is something else. Well, with such a new industry, there aren't a lot of people with more experience than you at this point. <laughs> I get ahead of it, right? You're six months in, in an expert. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm gonna get back to it. Though. All right, thank you, man. Yeah, you can add rebar to printed houses. They usually do vertical columns that are poured. I'll show you some of the sections they prepared for that. So you have a, a space like this that acts as a formwork and you can drop a rebar cage in there and backfill it with concrete, giving you a traditionally uh, engineered vertical column that it's usually what the engineers use to calculate the structural load of the uh, vertical load of the building uh, that holds the roof up. They don't rely on the structural integrity of the printed walls uh, instead, they use these vertical columns just because it makes everything easier for the permitting. Uh, these walls have some strength, so not using uh, their inherent strength at all seems like a drawback. But then there's the horizontal reinforcement. I don't know if it's fair to call it rebar, but it's like a thin gauge rebar. Uh, and that goes every 10 to 12 layers. Keeps everything horizontally intact let's see what questions did i miss
What's the proper way to finesse the uh, the hose? Man, it's all in the wrist, you know. Like Grandma told me, it's like mixing up a batch of homemade brownies or biscuits or butter, whatever you got to do. It's all in the wrist, man. Technique, finesse, take pride in what you do. All right. Everybody's got a great attitude on this job site. The mic's all the way over there, don't worry about it. <laughs> Oh, I guess I did not. Jason, I told you the mic was over here, but it was right on my shirt. But you can curse on my channel. It's not a, there's no kids in my audience. I don't think. Cool. So we'll keep the cursing to a minimum for her. All right, then have at it. Yeah. Uh, well, we can we can also put music over some of the some stuff. Or, yeah. Music's actually worse than cursing on YouTube. They'll uh, copyright strike oh, the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Actually, I could break out the old guitar. We can do some. Bro, we can do some. Awesome. That's badass. Yeah. All we got to do is get a Michelada, uh, maybe two. And
Where can you find this STL? Well, it's probably a step file, not an STL. Uh, and I doubt that they're giving it away. Christian, where can they find the STL? Uh, it doesn't exist. There is no STL, so nice try, buddy. But you could design a file like this yourself in uh, a lot of different programs. Oh, Rhino with Grasshopper is what people would usually use uh, so that you can have parametric design. The material is now not flowing, and uh, the they just stopped the machine. So a little hiccup, but it's something they'll easily recover from. Uh, they have about 10 minutes to, uh, to get the material off, and they'll be able to easily just roll it back and start from the point of uh, wherever it went wrong. So right now, Christian is kind of piece by piece evaluating what the best place to start back up will be. And we're in a perfect spot to get a great view when they bring it back on. Are you not entertained? Yeah, with a good team, it's not really stressful when uh, something like this happens because they know how to address it. So it's uh, it's not a mad rush. They uh, they know they've got the 10 minutes and uh, the way Eamon handled it was by rolling back about 10 centimeters past the line. So maybe they'll go back to like this point here and start back up. First start running the machine to get it going at full speed. And then once it's at constant velocity, they'll extrude the material again. Uh, and we'll see how they do this recovery. So this is the big moment right here seems like Christian's handling it all by himself. Okay, so they didn't go past the, uh, the point. They're right at the... You really have to appreciate the transparency to R-squared that they're uh, allowing a live footage of their print. I mean, every print I've ever gone to, something happens here or there. Most companies aren't willing to be transparent and straightforward and show it. Uh, but I think it's a really smart thing R squared is doing because they're showing that uh, not only it's not a perfect technology, they're the ones who know how to make it work. And uh, they're able to address these things pretty quickly without a catastrophic error. And I think that sharing that transparency, showing that transparency will make them uh, a winner in the market when people look for contractors the most important thing is in construction is a trust because you have to put a lot of weight on somebody's word they say they're going to build something do something uh and so by having transparency they're building that trust from the get-go It's not like you buy a MacBook Pro and turn it on. They had some uh, engineers coming out to look at the wiring. They're looking at adjusting some of the wiring on the machine. I mean, they're doing the R&D that will determine what the next models of this machine look like. And they'll probably share feedback with Black Buffalo. Uh, and maybe they'll help uh, distribute the printers at some point and help train teams that are going to operate these kind of systems. Here we go. I would say they've got four people uh, kind of working on the print right now, but they could get away with probably three. Uh, the mixer pump takes a lot of effort and that hasn't been in the shot much. Uh, they got a Ventures equipment mixer pump and they've got two people for most of the time just managing the material, make sure it's flowing from each of the kind of buckets. Uh, Let's go over. You guys want to see the mixer pump system or should I say it to print? Let me know in the comments. This is in Staples, Texas. 
Alquist is actually not on site anymore. They were on site last week. Uh, But Alquist was here. Uh, we had Eamon and Aaron from Alquist, and they kind of helped them start this print. Um, now the guys have been trained how it operates, and they've got Christian here from Black Buffalo instead of Eamon and Aaron, and uh, they're operating really smooth. As you can see, they recovered from that... Uh, section with no material and you can't even really tell the recovery is totally concealed within this inner wall so there's when this is backfilled it will be impossible to even know uh, at which point they had a start stop event all right you guys want to see the mixer you got it Got CEO Jason here working hard as always. Keeps himself very busy. No office work for the uh, construction site CEO. And then we got the mixer pump system. So the silo. And then it has a kind of pre mix phase where you get a slurry, which is further processed into uh, the blue part and then the mixer pump system. Uh, at that point, it should be pretty homogenous. Goes through the rotor stator into the printer. So this piece takes a bit of effort because you gotta work the material, make sure it's not all getting stuck in one corner and flowing through all the way to the end of the system. If you get some kind of uh, break in that flow, it will ultimately affect the outcome of your print at the extruder head. Here's how they load the material with the uh, jumbo bags. Hey, Chris, how do you feel about this loading system you guys are using? Is uh, is this effective? Is there anything you'd want to change? Oh, yeah. Uh, we've already got some plans to do um, a vertical lift. That way I can take the telehandler, the person, and the safety aspects out of the equation. So that way we can just possibly load all of our material for the house maybe in a silo uh, truck and then just feed it into the auger system and nobody has to touch it and it can stay in a dry environment. Sounds automated. I like that. Thanks. Christian looks like a Texan all of a sudden. What do I think of geopolymer? You know, it's hard to say. Uh, I've never seen a house printed in geopolymer and I don't like to speculate. So until I see it, uh, who knows? People say a lot of nice things about geopolymer, but uh, words don't count for much. What counts is building like these guys are doing right here.
Yeah, this home is in Staples, Texas. It's not permanent. Uh, but it will help them achieve the necessary steps to create permanent homes with this technology in this region going forward. I like the idea of aircrete, but uh, like I said, I'm not a speculator. So until I see people printing with aircrete, uh, maybe there's a reason that it can't be done. I mean, the material has to be compressed into the hose. Maybe that would affect the uh, air bubbles that aircrete has. Potentially, it could be whipped at the extruder head or something, uh, but I really wouldn't know until someone prints with it. I can film it and ask them about it. Uh, some kind of lightweight foam is usually, it's often used as the insulation uh, instead of backfilling some kind of loose fill. How will you guys do the insulation for this project? Um, so insulation, we have a lot of uh, different options that we can use. Uh, my background is heavily in HVAC and building um, science. so. This gets me excited because there's no moisture movement through the material and we can basically create any cavity size that we want. Um, but just due to the fact that we are in a hurricane flood prone area, I do want to do a closed cell that way if it does get wet, um, you know, we won't have that issue inside the walls and any accessibility issues as well. There are some other materials that we can use, but that's kind of what we got our eyes on. Would you use some kind of loose spill particulate or? We could, I mean, I think there's been some other um, talk about some different materials but if this does get wet my house was under eight feet of water in, in Friendswood during Harvey so I know for a can what that's like. Uh, loose fill is definitely an option we just need something that can dry out on some. Is this the, the plant top material or is this? Yes this is from Mont Bay um, exclusively for about flight buffalo um, operator it is the plant top 3D. There's no uh, hemp in this material. No. I know black buffalo was talking about hemp at one point do you sure. know anything about that? Um, I'm, I can't say too much about it, but I do know that things are still moving in that direction. As cool. An option, uh, which I'm excited about as well. Anything else? I don't know anything else about the hemp. <laughs> I do know that they're building some. Uh... Hey, isn't that one up there in Col or, uh, Canada that Cormore's doing? Have you been in contact with Lucas? A little bit. Yeah, we just got a train class with them and train uh, company in Kansas. Yeah, I don't know too much about the hemp stuff. Um, I do know the sourcing your your base material is going to be key because this stuff right now is coming out of New Jersey. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, if we can just get the ad mix and then source our base mix look, or our base material locally, we would save us huge on shipping. Um, but yeah, this has been working out pretty great. Managing the temperature and the humidity. You can see a drastic difference halfway up our walls during this morning now. You guys are definitely early adopters, so uh, not every you're the ones ironing things out so that people in the future can have, have a road more trodden down. Yeah, hopefully one day we'll be able to look at these videos and be like, hey, look what we used to do. And, uh, but you know, somebody's got to do it a certain way first, and then that's the only way we can do it. I mean, it isn't going to get the light bulb right the first time, you know. Somebody's gonna. This is their new uh, hydration method. They got a power washer, a lot more volume than uh, those wimpy misters. It's all trial and error. Different job sites. We have some potential, even where I live in Colorado, you know, it's a 20 to 30% heat 
average relative humidity. I'm not counting that direct sun closer at that elevation level. Um, so it'll just be dialing it in and having certain scenarios and certain mixes and water ratios. It won't be long. Say this is our first go. We've only been doing this, what, two weeks? So I think we're making huge strides. Yeah, I agree. Oh, it makes it cool. It's a really neat effect on camera. It's waterproof. Yeah, and I don't, I don't think that uh, we still had the idea originally when it first all started to actually enclose this into a, a tent, an inflatable tent, mm -hmm. in a controlled environment. Um, that's not out of the question yet. It's expensive. But if that's what it takes to give us a pretty good product, that's what we're going to have to do. It's nice to have the range of product offerings. Watch your hopper. Watch your hopper, Phil. Check your level. It's on the hat. Yeah, I've seen a lot of teams try to automate the hopper fill level, but it's such a tricky thing because the concrete, once it touches whatever the sensor is, it doesn't come off. That's right. Yeah, it's a little different animal um, coming from process heating and cooling. You know, we water the air, different things are easier to control in that manner, but this stuff sticks everything in the dust, the, the mud, it hardens. Yeah, we're, uh, we're getting close to a solution, maybe using a laser style level. Um, with our dry material, maybe even a weighted scale type system. But we're going to use it this way first, see what happens, and we've got a long list of notes. So. Yeah, I've been on a good amount of job sites, and this seems like a pretty safe environment. I mean, everything's moving pretty slowly. There's not a lot of compression points. Uh, there's a little dust from the when you're loading the system, but besides that, in this area, there's not really dust. Uh, there's not cutting. Uh, yeah, we're uh, there's an immediate solution um, for the silo, and again, that's a longer-term solution in, in terms of a vertical lift. Yeah. That. Um, but we're going to skirt it or put some sort of front along top to at least block it in. So it keeps that part uh, Indoor teams usually have some kind of fan with a, uh, a little circle to push out the yeah. dust outside or something. Yeah, those are all on the list of things to try, so it's just a matter of, again, there's nobody to... I often wonder, are some of the teams like, are they talking about the good stuff or are they trying to like mislead other competitors so that they try things that are like a uh, dead end? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's an Indian industry, really. Um, nobody wants to be given the wrong information about what's going on. Uh, they don't want to give away all their new R&D stuff, but kind of hard to hide it. True. Um, and it's so early that it's not like a blood in the water competition. Absolutely. And we're from the school that we don't care if everybody knows. I mean, we're, we're more than willing to, to share our ideas and come together because it's not about us. It's about what we're trying to do for everyone. Um, the housing crisis that we have going on, we can't do it alone. Um, you know, these machines can only pump out so many houses a year with a team. And we need everyone and every machine that we can get right now. Yeah, I mean, people can copy you, but as long as you keep working, they'll always still be one step behind. There's enough market share for everyone. I actually, that was one of my biggest concerns. I was like, like what are we going to do when competition starts coming out of the woodworks? And I did the math on it, and we have a 0. .0001 market share if everybody was to step in and try to hit the numbers to solve the problem in practice the way that it is currently. I mean, that market share makes you, like, what, a billion-dollar company or something? Something like that, yeah. Uh, it, it helps us grow, especially once it starts to catch on it, as it has been in the last 12 months. Um, there's, there's so much room for anyone and everyone that can come into this market. Uh, we're going to keep continuing to grow, but um, yeah, it, we, we're not going to be able to outgrow it. You participated in the uh, 
my course, how to 3D print a house, to watch some of the videos at least. Did you watch them all? I watched every one of them. Wow. So what's the uh, biggest criticism, the worst thing you thought about the course? <laughs> well, if I have to be completely honest, it's a little bit of a funny one, but when you go back to Dove Over, you do the little uh, sexy whispers. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's uh, everything else has been super great. Um, you know, because there's you have different perspectives. You've seen other people do it in a different way, um, and having that central hub of information has been so useful for me um, and the other guys as well. But I pay attention a lot to that. Uh, the stuff that you have, um, stuff that's on LinkedIn. You know, of course, you can go down the rabbit hole on YouTube pretty quickly. Yeah, I'll, since you didn't really criticize me hard enough, I'll criticize myself. I'd say the the biggest flaw in the course is it's only a beginner level. So once you actually buy the printer, it's every printer operates a little bit differently. You're not going to learn how to operate your Black Buffalo printer from my course. But uh, if you're looking at which printer to buy and trying to get an overview of how they work, that's just kind of what I created it for to kind of name all the moving pieces. Yeah. And uh, yeah, cool. It's, it, it's all an overlay. I mean, there's certain parts of this process that are the same no matter what machine you use. You know, gantry, robotic arm, uh, whatever it may be. The, mud, the concrete's still concrete. The pumps and the silos still all the same. Uh, it's just a, the different methods of delivery. But yeah, the, the entry level is definitely great. You know, when I came into this, I had no idea what this was. 3D printed house, cool. It's made of plastic. No, it's not. But uh, that's how everybody kind of enters into this. Um, and so once you kind of get the, the gantry down uh, and the robotic arm down, the pump is the same thing. Yeah, one of the next sections I want to work on is how to pick a printer. And what I'm uh, workshopping is the idea is you're really buying the team behind the printer because there's so much continued interaction with them. Is it's really a joint R and D effort. Uh, so, what do you think of that analysis and decision making matrix? Well, we found that instead of everyone trying to learn all of the different positions, is take one position. Yeah, it's interesting. There's so much work to be done to maximize the efficiency of automation on the site and so much training that needs to be done to like educate the workforce to get there. And then there's the, not done yet. Like there's still, that's when the work starts. Right. Well, luckily, as you can see, I mean, a lot of this is just kind of manual labor. Uh, keeping the walls wet, washing the hopper, making the concrete, loading the material. Uh, really the hardest part is operating the CNC controller and you know, knowing the decode and programming, of course. But uh, other than that, I can say it's all just willingness to work and strong back and yeah, it's a lot easier than uh, it's like CMU blocks or cinder blocks hauling those all day. I mean, the hardest labor today seems like the mixer bump job, just scraping the material. And even that's not that bad once you kind of get the groove. It's a shovel. Yeah, just making brownie batter all day long, and you're getting used to that consistency and just keep it there. So. It's like shoveling manure, but it smells better. Which surprisingly, that is the hardest and the most important position here, I feel, besides the CNC operator. Yeah, that's understated in my YouTube videos because the mixer pump is not something that's clickable or like fun or sexy, but it's like the heart of the engine of the, the machine. That'll be the very last thing that will ever get automated is that mix that you still have a human element that needs to be involved. Everything else, for the most part, we can probably skip. Yeah. I think you could do two people a day. It would just be a pain in the ass. Yeah. The mixer pump job would be tough alone. It's a backbreaker. For yeah, moving all the controls over and stuff and giving it uh, that one person access to just one side. Mm -hmm. That's not that far as I could go. Not at all. It's surprising how much different that is. Today couldn't have gone any better. We needed it. We needed it. For sure. Well, 
when they said, hey, oh, they cut her water, water off. Great. Okay, well, I guess, uh, can't take a shower or can't, can't run the bird. Good thing we don't need water, right? <laughs> We're in Staples, Texas, uh, like an hour 10, hour 20 from Austin. I don't know of anything, any hurricanes or tornadoes. Uh, I heard there was an earthquake in Mexico where there's some printed homes in the, it's like 7.8 or 7.5 magnitude and they uh, lasted. So that's promising. Players left. 